right. It is Tuesday, July 21st, 2020, 5 o'clock p.m. So the Rules, Confirmations, and Public Elections Committee. Um, let's do roll real quick. Council Member Evans. Here. Council Member Lee. I don't see her signed in right now. Council Member Leslie. Present and accounted for. Can't, can't see you though. Uh, Council Member Rutherford? Here. Council Member Sepulveda? Here. Okay. Council Member Sledge is not signed. I think he might be running codes on the other channel. Uh, Council Member Stiles? Present. Great. All right. We've got six out of eight. Uh, first, make a motion. Uh, pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 16 regarding electronic meetings, as extended by Executive Orders 34 and 51, I make a motion that this committee meeting agenda constitutes essential business of the Metropolitan Council, and that meeting electronically is necessary necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. The second. Second. All right, all in favor? I second. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Right. We're good to go. All right, first up, we have resolution 2024-54 by Hurt Styles and Benedict, supports the Metropolitan Public Health Department Chief Medical Director's order, mandating cloth face coverings or masks, and further urging that all citizens, residents, and visitors to Nashville and Davidson County, Tennessee, adhere to the order and observe proper facial covering when indicated. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hurt is not on. Council Member Stiles, do you want to speak to this? Yes, thank you so much, Chair. So this basically supports the mask mandate that has been in place, also the mask bill that we voted on two weeks ago, it's basically saying Metro supports public health and their decision. And we're just encouraging people to wear their mask at the end of the day and try and stay safe in the midst of COVID. Very simple request, just trying to be supportive. So if you'd all vote yes, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I believe this is pretty similar to one that was voted down last week. I think there were concerns about the Class C misdemeanor, and I think that there have been some clarifications since then. I don't know if anybody... There was a, a letter was sent out by Jameson, I believe, last week, clarifying that and, and the, the misdemeanor, because that had not been the original intention. Thank you. Um... Uh, oh, Mr. Jameson, you're here. Hi. Please. Hi. Yes. Yes. Lady Styles is absolutely uh, correct, and you are as well. There was some uh, confusion at the previous council meeting, some concern that we were making uh, a violation of the health director's order as a Class C misdemeanor. Uh, Metro was not making it. That just happens to be state law across the state. Any violation of a Board of Health's order uh, is a Class C misdemeanor. That does not new to this mask ordinance uh, or rather mask order uh it's not anything we could adjust but we're not adding to it uh that is simply the the lay of the land under state law at the moment great thank you mr jameson uh and council member sledge has joined us from his other committees so we have seven members present now uh any further discussion ready to vote is there anybody in opposition or wishing to abstain Seeing none, passes seven, it's approved seven in favor, none against. Thank you, Council Member Stiles. Wonderful, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have RS 2020-457, Murphy, Sepulveda, and others, recognizes 2020 Nashville Athena Young Professional Award recipient, Grace Stranch. Uh, Council Member Murphy, anything you'd like to speak on? Yes, I would just like to, um, to, this is, I think, 
uh, an award that supports young women. There is also a companion one that uh, a resolution that supports uh, women of an older age group. And so uh, they're kind of companion resolutions. And so I appreciate Council Lady Toom sponsoring that one for us. I think any time that we can uh, further promote uh, young women and women in general and their professional endeavors is a, a good thing that we should do. Um, and I'm a little biased because I was once a nominee. So, but you know, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Thank you, council member. Thank you for bringing this deep district 35 roots here. Uh, any additional discussion? Ready to vote? Anybody wish to vote no or abstain? All right, seven in favor, none against. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, RS 2024-58. This is council members Toombs, Murphy, and others recognizes 2020 Nashville Athena Traditional Award recipient, Key Bryant McCormick. Um, this council member Councilmember uh, Toombs, well. Council Toombs, I think is. Councilmember Toombs, do you want to speak on this? If she's not with us, I'm happy to. Okay. Uh, bye. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm on. Okay, uh, do you want to speak on the resolution for the uh, for Ms. Brian McCormick? Sure, uh, this is, she is the recipient of the traditional Athena Award, very prestigious award. I was actually nominated myself. Um, and so this is recognizing her accomplishments and the fact that she was uh, given that award. Great, thank you very much. Any other discussion? Ready to vote? Anybody wish to vote no or abstain? Great, seven in favor, none against. Thanks, Council Member Toombs. And we're on to some late files. Um, first up, RS 2020-449 has a late file amendment. Uh, Council Member Henderson, could you speak briefly to the reason it's late filed and reason we need it tonight, please? Council Member Henderson. All right, we'll come back to this one. Uh, next up, we have resolutions honoring, um, two separate resolutions honoring the lives of C.T. Vivian and Congressman Lewis. Um, Councilman, I think we understand why these were filed late um, and both sponsors are present. Does anybody want to hear any explanation on these? Everybody good with it? Great. Um, we should go ahead and vote since this is stuff that would be referred to us without objection. We'll take them up together. Does anybody want to abstain or vote no on either of these resolutions? Thank you. Seven, seven in favor. No again. Uh, the next late filed is a resolution approving an amendment to a grant from the Tennessee and Administrative Office of the Courts to the Metropolitan Government acting by and through General Sessions Music City Community Court Division 8 to implement a community court to combine the power of the community and the justice system to address local public safety concerns. Council Member Toombs, do you wanna to speak to why this is late filed and why uh, it needs to go tonight? Please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, uh, Judge Rachel Bell, who is uh, over the Music City Community Court, is on the line. She could better explain the urgency of, of getting the resolution through this evening. Okay, thanks, Council Member. Judge Bell, would you like to speak? Yes, um, thank you for um, having me today, um, this evening. Um, the Music City Community Court was awarded a grant with the United States Department of Justice, um, one of five courts in the United States of America. Um, and because of COVID-19, all of those courts were giving an amendment for the grant to go from June 30th until August 31st. With that, we also have developed a designated space for our court for all of Davidson County for ages 18 to 30. So we have a diversionary court called CARE, creating avenues for restoration and empowerment. And if an individual um, 
ends up getting a uh, a charge or an alle allegation, um, and they plead guilty or take that under advisement, and it's non-violent, they are able to divert their case to the Music City Community Court, again, for ages 18 to 30. So that designated space is over at the Magruder Center in zip code 37208 for Davidson County. It's about seven miles away from the Justice Birch Building. But the amount of money that the Tennessee Supreme Court Administrative Officer Courts and the Music City Community Court thought that we would use um, for the grant period is being repurposed to finish out building the designated space. So there's $17,503.37 the Administrative um, Supreme Court no longer needs to use for their um, budget. And so they're turning that money back over to us to use with general services with Metro um, as a department that we need to pay to have some of those things built out in our collateral um, documents to give individuals the information that they need. Um, so this is a community um, healing uh, focus and alternatives to incarceration where the community, the victims, um, peace circles are all in line with helping individuals um, navigate through the criminal justice system, um, albeit punishment, but as well as a restorative justice. So making sure that they have everything they need to actually no longer, hopefully, um, be part of the recidivism rate and continue to break the law. And so we're asking for $17,503.57 um, in our amendment for the uh, $200,000 uh, grant that is reimbursable. So Metro uh, does not have to pay for anything. You'll get reimbursed. Um, so this is a reimbursement grant with the United States Department of Justice, um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance Program with the Center for Court Innovation. Great. Thank you, Judge. Anybody have any questions or concerns on the late filed nature? All right. We're good to go. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, we'll go back to Councilmember Henderson. He's got a late filed, uh, I guess, an updated exhibit to 449. Councilmember Henderson, do you want to speak to why it's late filed and why it needs to go tonight, please? Um, yes, Chair Rosenberg. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. I'm in two meetings at once and muted and unmuted in various places. Um, this is an administration uh, bill um, coming from our Metro uh, Stormwater Division related to the storm by, uh, Stormwater Buyout Program that we do. Um, the uh, program from a federal perspective has changed um, and in fact strengthened um, uh, its uh, 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 data use uh, policies, um, which are in line with how we've already been doing that. But I think this is just a technical amendment. Um, and there there is a time constraint here as far as our uh, application and participation in the next round of the program. So the amendment is coming Thank from st uh, the Stormwater Division. Okay. Anybody have any concerns? All right. Thank you. Okay. We are on to bills on second reading. Uh, Council member Murphy, 2020-147 amends chapters 2.196 and sections 2.222.040 of the Metro Code regarding lobbyist registration and disclosure. Um, get a motion on the bill and substitute, please. I can motion, so move. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Murphy? I'd like to motion for my substitute as well. Already done. What, what, what's the substitute do? So my substitute is based off of um, further research um, from across the country of other cities, counties, states, um, and how they regulate the government's interactions with lobbyists. And at the end of the day, I, I came back to that I found the best way to update our Metro code was to stay as close to the current code as possible while adding sections and language from our state code. Um, I have found other concepts and regulations uh, in our ordinance in many of the other cities, and I've tweaked and I feel like I've found um, and tried to put together the best language from what my research has found. And if you'd like to see my research, it is at least one banker box full of papers. So more than happy to share at any time. 
Um, in summary, uh, I introduced this legislation in January. As you know, it came before us in May for second reading. The reason I had deferred it until then is because I have been asking and begging and pleading for community input that came very late in the process. Um, I was able to work with some members of the design professional community in June and at our special hearing gave them an update on that language and they did not give me any feedback until this past Monday. Thank you to Hannah Zeitlin for just going above and beyond helping me last week. Uh, probably more than 20 hours spent trying to get this substitute in the form that it needs to be in. And so I um, at the end of the day, I have incorporated suggestions from the Metro clerk, from the audit that the clerk requested of her process, from Metro Legal, from the Board of Ethical Conduct, from the lobbyist community, from the Chamber of Commerce, and the design professional community themselves, as, long as, as well as many of you um, who have participated in this process. And so with that, I am happy to answer questions but I think in summary, what this what this does is it 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 really adds what adds the bulk is is the important parts. Right now, complaints, there's not a way to file a complaint if someone has done something wrong, but there are punishments if somebody has done something wrong and they don't have their ability to have that adjudicated and due process. And I don't think that that is fair in a democracy. And so that's why this legislation jumped up about six pages. But um, what we are ultimately trying to solve here is, is really updating the code and modernizing it um, to fit what is reality now, um, but also keeping the definitions that have been there for 30 years, because sometimes you just can't reinvent the wheel. So with that, I'm happy to to answer any questions. Um, but at the end of the day, this bill does not redefine who is a lobbyist and does not redefine who has to register as a lobbyist. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of amendments. First, does anybody on the committee want to speak before we get to those? Okay, council member Van Rees, you have a pair of amendments. You want to uh, introduce your first? And I do. I, I have I have two, and they are not numbered. Um, but one appears in the packet first. So if you want to take that one first, we can do that. Um, but I will need somebody on the committee to um, move that so that we can talk about it. I think. All right. Have a motion and a second on the amendment, please. So moved. Second. Thank you, Councilmember Van Rees. Great. Um, this is um, the one that's uh, removing some language regarding lobbyist compensation. Uh, for me, it's it's the principle of the thing. Um, telling an industry how it pays itself is not something that I think the Metro Council should be doing. Um, and for that reason, uh, I've offered this amendment. Uh, happy to answer any questions as I can. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Murphy, do you wanna speak on this amendment? Yes, thank you. I disagree with this amendment because currently in the Metro Procurement Code, Chapter 4.48, Ethics and Public Contracting, so, so Section 4.48.080 prohibits contingency fees. It states it shall be a breach of ethical conduct or ethical standards for a person to be retained or to retain a person to solicit or secure a Metro government contract upon an agreement or understanding for a contingent commission, percentage, or brokerage fee, except for the retention of a bona fide employee or bona fide uh, established commercial selling agency for the purpose of securing business. Contingency fees are also banned at the state level when it comes to lobbying and in the majority, the overwhelming majority of research that I've done of other states and cities, they ban contingency fees when it comes to lobbying. And I'll just quickly quote that um, the Cornell Journal of Law and Public Policy speaks specifically to contingency fees saying, 
The concern is, is that the lobbyist whose fee is contingent upon success has a greater incentive to, quote, win at all costs. In contract to lobbyists who are in contrast to lobbyists who are paid an hourly fee, a lump sum or retainer monthly fee. As a result, contingency fee arrangements may promote the use of improper means such as distortion of relevant facts to ensure success. Contingency fee lobbying is much more likely to promote the, the interests of big business for big business related lobbying where the most money can be made. There is little reason to think that contingency fee lobbying would benefit the poor or reduce the disparities between the haves and the have nots. Furthermore, norm, numerous court decisions have condemned lobbyist contingency fees. Again, that was quoted from the Cornell Journal of Law and Public Policy. And I ultimately feel that ethics, um, when we're talking about, about contingency fees, they're already banned in the Metro Procurement Code. Um, our current code already speaks to them by requiring that they are written if they if people do enter into contingency fees. But ultimately, based on the body of research that I have done and the brief uh, quotes that I have shared with you, I think that they are wrong in lobbying, and I do not think that we should condone them. So I ask you to vote against the amendment. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, I, I wanted to point out Please. that uh, Budget and Finance did approve this amendment. Um, I, I appreciate all the the diligence, the due diligence that's gone into this. And um, commissions are not evil. <laughs> um, you can ask any real estate agent on the council uh, that uh, whenever you go into an industry, uh, the way it pays itself is not something the Metro Council should should take up. There's been no complaints in regard to um, the way in which it's uh, happening now. And it, it just seems like an overreach to me. Um, I welcome discussion. Thank you. Any further discussion on the amendment before we vote? I'm assuming Councilmember Murphy's hand is up from before. Uh, no. So no, Councilman. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up that that the fact is is that Metro already um, regulates contingency fees, and so it is not out of the realm of of our scope here to to also regulate contingency fees as well. Uh, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, that that's interesting. If it's already happening, why are we doing it here? It is regulated in the procurement code and then why why does the metro council need to take it up here because this is the lobbying code all right any further discussion seeing none we are ready to vote um everybody wishing to vote no or abstain please Raise your hand in WebEx and I'll ask you which you're doing. Okay. Uh, Council Member Rutherford, are you a no or an abstention? No. Council Member Murphy? Are you a no? No. Uh, Council Member Sepulveda? Are you a no? And I'm a no. So then we'll have council members Styles, Sledge, and uh, do I not have as yes or no? Styles, Sledge, and Evans as yeses. So that's three in favor, four against. Uh, council member Van, uh, uh, council member Van Reese has a second uh, amendment to the bill. Can I have a motion and a second on it, please? 
Motion so moved. Thank you, Councilmember Van Rees. Yeah, this one is um, a little bit more uh, straightforward in that um, it actually, I'm trying to pull it up, um, addresses uh, the provisions uh, regarding uh, elected officials, uh, department heads, employees, or the mayor's office serving or employed as of the date um, that this uh, takes place. Uh, the substitute actually asked for um, the date of um, the um, uh, execution of the date um, to be after um, the current term, um, simply as a matter of fairness so that anybody currently an elected official or department head and employee of the mayor's office or anyone serving or employed um, uh, as stated in the updated uh, um, amended uh, bill uh, simply um, has that opportunity. I tell you, this came up to me because there was a conversation in the previous term with Bob Mendes regarding um, health care benefits and whether or not uh, we should uh, change them for the council members. And uh, I adamantly oppose that we do it during the term of those already elected. That if we take up anything that actually affects those that are in office, that it should happen uh, at the next term. Uh, so that simply um, those that are uh, applying for the job, if you will, uh, know what the provisions are at the time of, of that. And so um, that's that's the reason and intent of this amendment, and uh, I ask for your support. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Murphy. Thank you, Chairman. So this language I did tweak after conversations with the Chamber of Commerce that really helped me, um, I think, shape the cooling off period and the revolving door in a much better way than we had originally had it drafted. And so what the way we have it drafted now is so for department heads, employees of the mayor's office, it's that they cannot be registered lobbyists um, for 12 months after they leave off or leave working for Metro um, in that position on things that was in their official responsibility. So right now, if we have a, you know, the mayor's office has an education specialist, they could not lobby on education for 12 months, but they could consult on education or they could lobby on other issues such as environmental policy. And then I did keep the part about uh, elected officials because again, um, over 28 states, um, including Tennessee, have prohibitions on and regulations that exist primarily because of the perceived advantage that former elected officials or employees have in representing their clients before their former governmental department co-workers. And this is also not new. In our procurement code, we also have cooling off periods. In fact, our procurement code goes so far to permanently ban some public um, officials and, and employees from ever participating in the procurement code. And so I think that 12 months is not, is not a lot to ask uh, before you cash in on your public service. Um, often, you know, again, I'm going to quote the Cornell Journal of Law and Public Policy that writes, the risk is obvious that a client represented by a public servant turned lobbyist will have or will appear to have an unfair advantage in petitioning the government. This type of conduct pro pro poses a significant threat to the integrity of democratic institutions. So again, um, the perception is, is that we would be able to turn around and use our personal conducts, our personal contacts to take home big paychecks that pay taxpayers ultimately are paying the price for in the end. And so again, I think that although this is uh, something that would affect uh, some of us uh, immediately leaving office, I was a lobbyist for um, Metro before becoming a Metro uh, employee and elected official. 
afterwards, I might want to pursue that again, but I'm willing to do a cooling off period if that is what is this, the research shows is best for government, but I'm at the will of the body. Okay, thank you. Um, for clarity, this amendment says that this section, the cooling off period, does not apply to anyone who is serving or employed as of the day that this section is enacted. Um, Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I know I mentioned this yesterday in budget and finance, but you know, some of us don't have the luxury as others. And being able to use some of the knowledge and experience that we may have gained as a council member and able to move forward. And I mean, I didn't even really know what a lobbyist was. I didn't even realize that until after I became involved pretty much in, uh, you know, well beyond my 40 years of age. And had I known that, then I think I would have, and, and I've actually spoken up for people prior to becoming a council member and, 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 and being able to deliver and never got paid for it. Had I known that I could have registered as a lobbyist and been able to do that, I would have. So now that I have a family that I need to take care of, if something happens and, and I need to leave the job that I have and I'm able to become a lobbyist in order to care for my family, I wanna have that right to be able to do it. I don't wanna be penalized. And what me being here, I earned it. It wasn't just something handed to me. So I think, that strapping people, you know, it's almost like strapping a lawyer because he or she knows something and they have an advantage. So it's going to be advantage on the individual or advantage on the government. And I think that one washes the other. And I just don't, I just don't think that restricts restriction for elected officials need to be there. And I know it's cooling off period, but people can go bankrupt in cooling off. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, any other discussion on the amendment before we vote? Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, is um, is John Cooper or Hannah uh, present? Uh, if I if I could ask for um, some help on the definition between lobbyist and consultant um, as it relates to uh, the bill as currently amended. Hannah, are you here? Yes, uh, I'm here. This is Hannah Zeidlin from the council office. So uh, give me one second. So uh, consultant is not really defined in the bill, so it's a little hard to give an exact definition just um, under the bill. But I think that the real difference, I, I think, in the discussion has been uh, between consulting and lobbying is, is that lobbying is really requiring contact with Metro, either either the legislative branch or the executive branch or both. Uh, I think that consulting a lot of the time is more, I guess, in-house. It's uh, a private company and you may be discussing things about, uh, you know, what the procedures are at Metro, but you're not actually engaging with Metro on behalf of the company. Thank you, Ms. Adlin. Uh, council members, I answer your question. Well, so it's, it's, it's rather self-defined then. A, a person can call themselves a consultant, but they become under this uh, Murphy bill, they become a lobbyist when they uh, engage with um, and elected to persuade. Um, Hannah, I was going to say, is that is that a question for you? Oh, yeah, that was Hannah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so yes, I mean, so 
I guess the important thing to, to think of is that a, a person who in, is a lobbyist, that's someone who engages in lobbying for compensation, is who would have to register under this. So it's it doesn't matter if they call themselves a consultant. If they are lobbying then they for compensation, then they would be considered a lobbyist under this legislation, and they would have to register. Thank you. Ms. Island, is that true under the current code as well? Correct. Uh, the definition of lobbying under the current code is a little different. It doesn't have that for compensation piece. Uh, the current definition is, give me one second. I'm gonna try to read it, read it right off. Oh, of course I didn't type it in right. Lobbyist means any person who engages in lobbying. That's the current 2196.020. Uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm at the will of the committee at this point. I, I, I made my point as to why it's there. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, will anybody who wishes to vote no or abstain? Chair. Yes. Councilmember Stiles? Uh, thank you. So my question would be, would the sponsor consider splitting the difference in that it's a uh, six month moratorium versus a year of not being able to participate? Councilmember Murphy. Um, I think for clarity's sake, I'm definitely open to, to late filed amendments on third. Um, I know that several budget committee members reached out to me last night because they were confused about the the amendments that were discussed there and what was passed and not passed out. I'm not sure if we want to go through um, doing a late file tonight or if we'd rather just do that, discuss that and do that on third and do it as a late file or a rule suspension on third just for clarity tonight because there seemed to be a lot of confusion and budget is what I've been, what I've been relayed. And I'm open, I'm open to discussion because again, I filed this bill in January seeking for input and, and got some in late June and then did not get any more until this past Monday. So very open to input. Um, I would like to hear other people's opinions on that as well. Uh, chair, if I may. Oh, oh, one second. Councilmember Stiles? Councilmember Stiles, did you have anything? Uh, yes, I just wanted to, I wanted to thank Councilmember Murphy for, for um, being flexible. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Van Reeves. I'm sorry. I am fine making a motion on the floor to do the fine information. Thank you. Um, Council Member Van Rees. Um, yes, I'd like to um, move that I defer this amendment um, uh, so that we can continue working on it and uh, let Council Member Murphy that I will do the same tonight. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can get it right for a third reading. Okay, then we are back. Thank you, council member. Then we're back on the bill as, um, we're back on the bill, uh, the, the second substitute as filed. Any further discussion? All right, I lost my hands. Oh, yeah, there, there. Um, Nick, okay, so we are ready to vote. Does anybody who wishes, I'm sorry, did, did we um, vote to substitute already? Oh, I, I withdrew the second substitute in an attempt uh, to bring it back. That's what I, I was trying to Council member, second substitute. It was my sub second okay, substitute. Okay, all right. Um, the others were I don't believe we did share. Right. Okay. Did all right. Does anybody wish to vote no or abstain or, or uh, abstain on the motion to substitute? All right. Okay. Now we're on the bill as substituted. Anybody wishing to vote no or abstain, please raise your hand. Seeing none. 
Uh, seven in favor, none against on the bill as substituted. All right, thank you. And then we have uh, four elections and confirmations, and then we'll be ready to move on to uh, the school board appointment, uh, which was scheduled to begin at 5.30. Um, first up, we have the Board of Health, the appointment of Dr. Calvin Smith III for a term expiring May 30, 2025. Uh, Dr. Smith, are you on the call? Hi, Councilman Rosenberg. Uh, this is Elizabeth Waisman from Clerk. I'm, I'm working on that now. Uh, it appears that he may be having some technical issues. I'm going to try to uh, resolve it in a couple of different ways as quickly as I can. Okay, we'll come back to it. Thank you, Ms. Waits. Uh, then let's uh, move back to the heel and take up the Board of Parks and Recreation, the appointment of Mr. Cruz Johnston for a term expiring April 30th, 2025. Uh, Mr. Johnston? Yes. Hi. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself and talk about your interest in serving on the Board of Parks and Recreation? Okay. So, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. These are always fun. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm a big golfer, uh, big hiker, um, spend a lot of time outdoors in our park system. Um, and um, it's just, I know George, uh, George Anderson, who's been on the board a long time, and uh, was talking to him about it a little bit. It just sounded like, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of get involved civically. And, um, um, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Cruz Johnston. I'm a commercial real estate broker here in Nashville. I've lived here for 30 years, had three daughters, uh, all, all raised here in the West Nashville area, District 24, I think. And um, anyway, yes, yeah, so I've got a passion. I, I, I got a passion for that, and I think that's a way I can uh, perform my civic duty. I, I don't think I can do what you guys just did. That that was <laughs> that's tough, man. I appreciate that that hard work, uh, but. Um, yeah, so I just think it's a way to use perhaps what little talent I have to uh, help. Great. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Johnston? Please chime in. I do. Go for it. Go ahead, Council Member Murphy. This is Council Lady Murphy. Uh, Thank you. I am Mr. Johnson's council member, and I just wanted to uh, thank him for his willingness to serve on this. I have often said that District 24 is extremely blessed to have um, what I consider country club level um, parks and recreation facilities. And so that is why I'm excited to have um, members from my area be able to advocate for similar um, facilities in other districts because we know and we love them well and my constituents are so passionate about them that they are the perfect advocates to go out and, and see what we can really do um, in other areas. So thank you, Mr. Johnson, for being involved in the community and thank you for being willing to serve on this board. And, and if other people have questions and things, that's like, uh, I'll cool my heels, but I'd love to make a motion to approve when appropriate. Thank you, council member. Um, seeing nobody else, can we have a second on council member Murphy's motion? Okay. Second. Great. All right. Does anybody wish to abstain or vote no on the appointment of Mr. Johnston? Seeing none, we are seven in favor, none against. Thank you, Mr. Johnston. And we will see you next door for the council meeting. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the Transportation, Transportation Licensing Commission, the reappointments of Mr. Freddie Carr, and Mr. Sal Hernandez for a term for terms expiring April 30th, 2022. I see Mr. Hernandez and um, I don't see Mr. Carr. Ms. Waits, is that a yeah, work in progress? No, I, I just spoke with Mr. Carr. I believe he's on the line. Um, Mr. Carr, are you able to have audio? Can you talk to us? 
Um, I've asked ITF, who may be listening, uh, to please add anybody who's called in on this meeting to include them as a panelist to make sure that they have audio privileges and can speak with the committee. Thank you, Ms. Waits. Um, so let's go ahead and start with Mr. Hernandez while Mr. Carr gets, gets squared away. Mr. Hernandez, would you mind introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your time on the committee, on the commission? Yes, hi, uh, my name's Sal Hernandez. I've lived in Nashville for almost 25 years and uh, went to the hospital and been practicing law since then. Uh, I've served on the Trust and License Commission now for several years, and uh, it's a it's definitely a um, a, um, a a commitment um, and uh, something that you know a civically minded person needs to be willing to do. Um, there are lots of people out there that could. could uh, handle the appointment. Uh, I'm happy to be reappointed uh, for another term. I've been the chair now for years. We've had a number of issues uh, come up uh, for the committee, uh, plates uh, that we've had to handle, uh, the, the, the rise of all of the SRBDs uh, as well as the uh, moving vehicles and the Gear tablets and whatnot. It's been some very interesting issues we've had to deal with. And I'm happy to uh, continue uh, with another report. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Um, I'm hearing some background. Mr. Carr, are you there? Mr. Carr? Somebody has signed in through a telephone and they've got noise coming through their phone right now. Um, so. I think that Mr. Carr may be on the call with the help desk right now, so that means that he may be having some issues with actually resolving this WebEx application. Um, can we ask that, that these be pushed to the heel? Uh, this is the heel. That's all well, Dr. Smith. Uh, I thought perhaps that the Rules Committee might be able to reconvene after the Board of Education interviews. Okay, I'm seeing Mr. Carr signed in right now, actually. Mr. Carr, can you, are you still checked out? Okay. All right, um, so why don't we? Uh, yes, I'm here. Hey, all right, success. Just as the buzzer was sounding, uh, thank you for being here and fighting through the, uh, the technical difficulties. Um, this is Dr. Wait, Mr. Carr is still muted. So is this Dr. Smith or Mr. Carr? Uh, I'm here. I don't know if there's Who's a I? here. Oh, it's Freddie Carr. Great. All right. Would you mind, uh, the joys of electronic governance, would you mind introducing yourself and talking a bit about your time on the commission? Okay. So my name is Freddie Carr. I'm 51 years old. I am a native Nashvillian. Uh, I was born in Davidson County. Um, um, I went to all, uh, well, I moved out to the suburbs in Priest Lake when I was in the second grade, went to Ezell Harden, uh, then went on to um, MTSU, worked for Bridgestone for 15 years, left Bridgestone, uh, start, started some businesses of my own, one being a uh, transportation company with the now uh, last mile division of DHL being defunct. And, but now I have a, a privately owned uh, logistics company that does business with Home Depot and Lowe's and Peloton bikes and, and design within reach. So I am in and about and around Nashville and the surrounding counties in the transportation uh, part of the industry now since 2003. Great, thank you, Mr. Carr. Uh, any questions for Mr. Carr or Mr. Hernandez or comments? Well, thank you all for dealing with, I know it is challenging, especially given the way that some of our authorities uh, interact with the state's authorities as far as some of the fun uh, 
types of vehicles we see moseying around Nashville. Um, and, and it's a lot, and we thank you for your service. Uh, if anybody would like to vote no or abstain on either reappointment, can you raise your hand, please? Seeing none, we're both seven in favor, none against. Thank you both very much, and we'll see you next door in the chamber. Um, Ms. Waits, do you know if Dr. Smith is still working with someone? I'm afraid I don't have an update on that. All right, thank you. Um, so why don't we just call this a recess for now? Um, and we can come back and adjourn after the joint meeting in case uh, Dr. Smith shows up. Thank you. We are working on it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know this is a moving target. Um, so rules is ready for the joint uh, rules and education committee meetings. Uh, Chair Lady Porterfield, is education committee ready to join us? Yes, sir. We are ready to join. Thank you very much. Um, I'll again uh, make a motion pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Order 16 regarding electronic meetings as extended by Executive Orders 34 and 51. I'll make a motion that this committee meeting agenda constitutes essential business, the Metropolitan Council, and the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, second. second. All right. Any, all in favor? Any against? Aye. All right. So we are here for the um, election to fill a vacancy in the District 4 uh, Met, uh, Nashville Board of Education until the next available general election. Uh, welcome to this joint committee of uh, rules, confirmations, and public elections and the Metro Education Committee. I uh, will be interviewing candidates for the school board vacancy in District 4. Uh, the candidates will be voted upon at the council meeting tonight. Unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time with each of our candidates, so we'll employ the following process. Each candidate will be called forward separately in alphabetical order. I'll ask the candidates give a brief introduction, their experience with Metro schools and why they're running for this position, lasting preferably no more than two minutes. After that, we'll open the floor for questions from members of the Rules and Education Committees. Uh, out of respect for the only seven minutes we're gonna get with each candidate, I'll ask that you dispense with any preambles and get right to your question. Questions begin with who, what, when, where, why, and how. Uh, if you can't state your question in about 15 seconds, please yield your time to council members so that we can get as much uh, feedback from these candidates who have uh, agreed to be with us tonight as possible. Uh, my hope is that if we have to address any vacancies in the future, we'll have adequate time with each candidate, um, but we're here for tonight. Uh, in the interest of fairness, each interview will be cut off at seven minutes even if it's mid-question because we're up against announcements, which is supposed to start in five minutes. Sorry, pro tem Syracuse, uh, and our council meeting. At the conclusion of the interviews, the rules committee members only uh, under the rules will be asked to vote on whether the candidates meet the required qualifications for the job. Committee members, you are not choosing the candidate you'll vote for on the floor. You're only voting on whether each candidate is properly qualified. The candidates will be in order. Stephanie Bradford, Chief Steve Chauncey, John Little, and Berthina Nabama kenny uh, Chair Porterfield, would you like to add anything before we start? No, sir, you're doing a fine job. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, Ms. Bradford, um, I see you here. Um, a few quick questions as far as qualifications. Are you at least 25 years old? Yes. Have you been a resident of Davidson County for the past five years? Yes. Have you lived in School Board District 4 for at least one year? Yes. Are you a registered voter in Davidson County? Yes. Do you hold any other elective or appointed public office? No. All right, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background in public education and metro schools and why you're running. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Stephanie Drake Bradford. I am a 
product of MMPS schools. I graduated from White's Creek High School. I'm a third generation educator. I am a wife and mom of two children here in District 4. I have 18 years of educational experience, 15 years in the pre-K through 12 school setting with 12 of those years being right here in MMPS schools. I have been a classroom teacher, a reading specialist, literacy coach, and dean of instruction. I have three degrees in education, my bachelor's, of, uh, bachelor's in elementary education, master's in reading, where I'm a certified reading specialist for the state of Tennessee, an educational specialist degree in administration and supervision, which means I am a, a licensed school administrator. Also, I have worked in other roles, nonprofit and the local and state level. I've worked with the National Public Library as the literacy project coordinator, where we um, we're community partners with Metro National Public Schools, and currently I work for the Center for Educational Leadership, where I partner with schools and school districts across the nation. And in that role, we help leaders become courageous leaders in the classroom setting and the school district setting to ensure that um, all kids have equity. How my experience with Metro School started in 1985 as a kindergarten student at Kings Lane Elementary School. Where, that, where I matriculated in District 1 schools and graduated, of course, from White's Creek. Um, I'm also the daughter of a now retired Metro school teacher. So I spent many years in her classroom volunteering. I Next, I served, of course, in Metro for 12 years. And um, most importantly, I'm a mom of two kids. I have served as the PTO secretary at their school. I volunteer in their schools. And why I am running for this position, I just want to help transform our schools and empower our students, regardless of their backgrounds and their zip codes, to create limitless futures for our students, for our students' families, our communities, and of course, our world, because they will go out um, lifelong citizens. And I believe that my practical literacy experience, my professional experience will serve as an asset to the school board by impacting policies, curriculum, budgets, and overall oversight. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. Um, Mr. Little, would you mind muting, please? Getting some sound from over there. All right, um, folks, uh, council, uh, Committee members and anybody in the council who has questions for Ms. Bradford, please raise your hands and I will uh, recognize you. I try to scroll through a long list here. Uh, council member Welsh, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Bradford, I was wondering if you could um, explain to me your position on charter schools and public school money going um, to uh, organizations outside of the public school system without the full oversight of the public school system. Okay. First, let me start by saying I believe all parents have the right to make the best choice for their children in regards of their learning. However, I am approach um, traditional schools, I believe that Metro is having to fund two entities. They're having to fund the traditional school setting and then they're having to fund the charter. And when I think about the 40-day count and our money, um, if a charter school sends a, a child back to their own school, we don't get the money back per se, and so our funding is a big deal in that regard, so. Thank you, thank you, uh, Council Member Welsh. Anything else? Okay. Deal. Um, Sorry, I'm sorry, Council Member Walsh, did you have more? Um, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was also wondering, Ms. Bradford, if you could tell me what you think your most important um, role as a school board member is. So I believe my most important role is to build relationships 
with our the constituents in District 4. Relationships are very important, and if the board is responsible for oversight of policy and the funding and planning curriculum, I need to know what the needs are of our community, the constituents, what are the needs of the schools, the teachers, the administrators, our support staff, because in order to make to um, create equitable policies across the district, we need the voice of the constituents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cash. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bradford, um, what's your feeling on teacher pay and if we need to um, prioritize that and what as a school board member could you do to, to prioritize increasing teacher pay? So yes, I do think we need to prioritize teacher pay. I also think we need to think outside the box of ways to um, attract and retain our teachers, whether we are working with apartment complexes, housing developments to ensure our teachers are attracted and want to be. I do think we should look at the budget to see where are the where is the money going? Are we being good stewards of the money that um, is allocated to the school district and so yes yeah, support staff our teachers their qu quality pay is very important thank you thank you council member porterfield we got about 15 seconds left with ms bradford fortunately uh if there's time ms bradford uh, what would you like to accomplish on school board what's your number one priority my number one priority is to continue to be a positive relationship with board members and Dr. Battle. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. Thank you. Um, we'll just go through speed round like things here. Uh, Mr. Chauncey, are you available? Or are you on the call? I believe it's Dr. Chauncey. Sorry, Dr. Chauncey? Yes. Hi. Um, Dr. Chauncey, would you uh, welcome? Um, are you at least 25 years old? Yes. Have you been a resident of Davidson County for the past five years? Yes. Have you lived in School Board District 4 for at least? Yes. Are you registered? Uh, Chair, you were muted. Uh, Dr. Chauncey, are you a registered voter in Davidson County? He's muted right now. Dr. Chauncey, you're muted. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, I am a resident. Uh, do you hold any other elective or appointive public office? I do not. All right. Please tell us a little about yourself, your background in public education and metro schools, and why you're running. Uh, I am, of course, Dr. Steve Chauncey. I'm a product of Metro National Public Schools. I graduated from East High School, um, University of Tennessee graduate, uh, Trevecca University, Master's of Science, and a doctor from Tennessee State University. Uh, my qualifications are on the website. I uh, certainly want to make sure our schools are the best public schools that they possibly can be. Uh, I have the uh, senior experience of uh, dealing with uh, the unfortunate and untimely loss of uh, Anna Shepard. I have extensive experience in all areas of the Metro public school system. After retirement, uh, I was not very sure that work. So I just desire to see uh, the school system uh, reach the accountability of a level of excellency, excellency uh, with the uh, state uh, accountability. Uh, I have extensive experience in budgets and uh, expenditures and large uh, organizations. Uh, I certainly have sent uh, um, as far as expenditures and budgets, I'm data driven. I make sure that I make decisions uh, surrounded uh, by evidence. I make sure that uh, I know how to navigate and help uh, our citizens uh, resolve complaints. 
I'm clearly qualified and experienced candidates uh, with knowledge of all levels of the school system. Uh, I try to make sure that uh, we take uh, different approaches action steps to make sure that we have a result uh, based school system. Again, uh, we spend $3 million of a $933 million budget on charter schools. I am a traditional school uh, backer. I certainly uh, realize that uh, different parents and different students uh, have the uh, right for their own the educational needs, but I still certainly think that we divert a lot of our funds uh, uh, that the, from taxpayer dollars that go to charter schools. Thank you, Dr. Chauncey. Uh, Members, please raise your hand in the queue. Uh, if you, uh, uh, Chair Lady Porterfield. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Chauncey, for sharing that information. Um, what is your number one priority if you're appointed to the school board? My number one priority would make sure that we move the school system uh, according to the Tennessee Department of Education through the six performance standards to where we are a school district uh, classified as excellence in comparison to all of our surrounding counties. Councilmember Porterfield, anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Councilmember Stiles. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Chauncey, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to run or be appointed for this position at this particular moment? Well, again, I, I, I felt like uh, after uh, well, the untimely death of Ms. Shepard, I had uh, lived in this community. i would worked all over the city of Nashville. I've been in the South, I've been in the North, I've been in the West, and I've never really uh, worked and uh, served the citizens in my own neighborhood. So one of those uh, reasons to uh, be on the school board is uh, to represent the citizens and do the very best I can to help uh, the administrators, teachers, and uh, uh, the staff uh, within the schools, not only uh, in, in, in District 4, but all over the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Chauncey. Council Member Welsh. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Chauncey, given the um, breadth of your experience in education, um, what part of your background do you feel is most important and um, gives you the leg up in coming to the school board? I certainly think that I have experience in every phases of the school system operating uh, with significantly large amount of budgets, uh, finances and the accountability and the uh, expenditures of money. I think it's very important that as we spend 54 cents out of every tax dollars, that we must uh, find ways to uh, move our school system forward. I uh, certainly have the mentality of, uh, of an ombudsman. I like as a, being a board member, I'd like to listen to, to all stakeholders and make sure that we are moving the school system along, uh, helping and assisting the director of school and her leadership uh, to seek the very best uh, uh, schools possible. But again, I think uh, budgetary, also uh, relationships with, with all stakeholders uh, is very, very important. I think that is uh, an organization. I, I'm very, very organized again. And uh, uh, as I've repeated before, all of my decisions are based on evidence and data surrounding the issue. And I have uh, undoubtedly uh, know every phase uh, from uh, the director's office uh, down to as the cafeteria workers and all of these individuals. Uh, I've always said that when I went into the schools, I always try to uh, I'll make friends immediately with the bookkeeper, the custodian, and the manager of the cafeteria. And once those people were on my side, 
uh, we had a very good good school system. So I think it's very important as uh, as everyone knows, relationships with people and that they trust you and believe in you as you lead them. And I think it's very, very important that uh, that our school system uh, uses the citizens' money to their very, very best to get the most for the dollar. Thank you. Great, thank you. By the time I finish this sentence, we're gonna be out of time with Dr. Chauncey. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Chauncey. Uh, we are on to Mr. L John Little. Mr. Little, um, are you at least 25 years old? Yes, sir. Have you been a resident of Davidson County for the past five years? Yes, sir. Have you lived in school board district four for at least one year? I did. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Chauncey, could you hit mute, please? Uh, are you, uh, uh, did I just ask if you're a registered voter in Davidson County? Um, yes. Do you hold any other elective or a point of public office? I do not, no. So, so about yourself, your background in public education and metro schools and why you're running. Okay, awesome. And, and thank you guys for having me this evening. So, of course, my name is John Lewis, and I'm a native Nashvilleian. I grew up attending our metro public schools. I went to Inglewood and Dalewood for elementary, Lytton for middle school, and, and Stratford High. And I'm a proud parent right now of a metro student who is driving at a Tennessee reward school. I'm deeply motivated to see that all of our schools succeed and give each and every one of our children the education they deserve an education that will make them whole, our community stronger and more prosperous. You know, beyond my personal stake in the outcome, I have the leadership skills and the experience to move our district forward. Since graduating from Tennessee State University, I've dedicated my entire adult life to the causes that advance the lives of the least among us. My professional journey in advocacy and education started in 2006 when I was appointed by the governor, Governor Bredesen, to lead the governor's children's cabinet and serve as a lead recruiter for a mentoring initiative um, that was a first of its kind mentoring program that really focused on kids who were aging out of foster care. I was fresh out of college. You know, I wanted to change the world and I, I realized that it takes more work. Um, and so as I think about my work in MNPS, outside of being a student myself, you know, I pursued my graduate degree in education. And after working for over a year, pairing mentors with teenagers, I realized that it wasn't going to happen between 14 and 18, but early childhood development was really important in that intervention. And so since 2007, since I graduated from um, Tennessee State University, I've just been a constant and dedicated volunteer for education nonprofit that's worked in high schools with students who need additional emotional support. And so uh, another question is, why do I want to be on this board? You know, I'm an expert at something that this city needs in 2020. You know, this city needs the expertise of a black man from East Nashville. As we think about students, as we think about the new discipline policy that the board just passed, at least 20% of our students in MMPS are black males. And, you know, we're passing policy, policies, and you need an expert or someone who can relate to it. I've talked to many of you guys, um, catching you on the fly while you've been on your way to work or after work, and I told you about my story. I told you where I started at and where I've ended up here in front of you guys. And I, I really want to be on the board to bring that type of experience. I want to bring the heart. I want to bring the dedication. And I also want to bring the passion of being a uniter. Um, that's something that I've done when I was working at the schools. It's something that I've done traveling up to Jordan Middle School or coming back to Stratford High as I was walked out the wrong way. I came back in with the red carpet. And so as we think about MMPS at this critical moment, I want to lay the red carpet out, not only for our students, but for our teachers and more importantly, for our parents. Because as I think about Nashville, but more importantly, District 4, I mean, our families love our elementary schools. I mean, they're over and road. Our elementary schools have portables. But then when you think about our middle schools, our middle schools are struggling. Our DuPonts, Tyler and Hadley, and, and definitely Two Rivers. And that's our pipeline to the only high school in our district, which is McGavick. And so I want to be a uniter. I want to work hard. And again, I want to lay out the red carpet for everyone who has a stake in public education. Thank you, Mr. Little. 
Uh, Council Member Porterfield. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Little, for sharing that information. What is your number one priority if you're appointed? My number one priority is really, it's first District 4, but I think some of the things that we can do in District 4 will really benefit the whole district. And it's really understanding why are thousands of parents leaving the school system um, when they when their child gets ready for the fifth grade. You know, the transition from fourth to fifth grade, we lose thousands. And when I look at our middle schools in the McGavick Cluster District 4, we have the capacity to have them filled. And as we think about budget issues, right, um, we have had to make some tough budget um, decisions. And you guys have, you know, carried the weight. I mean, I watched you guys to four in the morning carry the weight on, like, how do we fund, you know, the city, but definitely our schools. And so, in my opinion, if, if we were listening to parents and teachers, as I have been, and understanding what is the perception they have of our middle schools and how can we fix it, I think that will help solve some of our problem with thousands of families leaving during middle school and actually bringing millions of dollars back to our school system since we have the capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rutherford. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Little. And um, I, I have a three part question. I'll get through okay. really quickly. Um, what, with your background and experience as a um, education advocate, what, what is your impression of the relationship between our charter schools leadership and the leadership at MMPS? And secondly, uh, do you believe charter schools have been a success in Metro? And if so, do we need more charter schools? Okay, that, that is a three part question. Um, so I'll start with, and this is a rhetorical question. As a parent, do you want the best for your kid? Um, and as I'll sit in, when I worked at Nashville Prep, which was a charter school, I was a family engagement specialist. That unique experience led me to sit in the living rooms of hundreds of parents across the district, not only in North Nashville or East Nashville, but right here in District 4, as some parents will even stand for Montessori. They had to make that decision, do I want to send my kid to the zone school? And a lot of their choices were charter schools. Um, and so I think charter schools have a place, right? But as we think about why charter schools were created, they were created as schools of, of innovation. And so why can't we take what we're learning from some of these and actually apply it to some of our traditional schools to help out? Same thing with our magnet schools. I mean, our magnet schools are doing some great things. Hume Fogg and MLK are some of the best schools in the, in the country, not just Tennessee. And we need to be taking those things and applying them to the schools um, where we think it can work. I think the big question is, um, do we need more charter schools? I think that is a decision that the board has been debating. I'll tell you my personal preference. I think we have a good amount of charter schools. I think we are partnering with the district and we need to do more. I think if you ask me, do we need more charter schools in East Nashville or North Nashville? I would say no. But if you think about Southeast Nashville, they have portables on top of portables. And as I've been talking with school board members, they say we want to approve them, but we need to work out a better deal. And so instead of a 10 year um, lease agreement, they want to do like a six year. So that's it. <laughs> There's the buzzer. Thank it's you, like three well. parts, man. I had to get it all in. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Nabal McKinney, I see you. Um, are you at least 25 years old? Yes. Have you been a resident of Dis Davidson County for the past five years? Yes. Or have you lived in school board district four for at least one year? Yes. Are you a registered voter in Davidson County? Yes. Do you hold any other elect? or a point of office, public office? So I don't know what this represents. I'm a commissioner on the Metro Action Commission. Got it, thank you. you step in, got it. Yes. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background in public education and Metro schools and why you're running. Sure, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the Metro Council and members of the Rules and Education Committee and, and Metro Council members. Uh, for having me tonight. Before I get started, um, I do want to take a brief moment uh, to give a heartfelt condolences to the family of Anna Shepard, her friends and community members in District 4. Anna was a true champion for public education, and she will surely be missed um, in our district. 
Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a, um, I'm a former Metro teacher. I started my career at Antioch High School. Actually, let me roll back. I was born in Nashville, grew up in Indiana, so I'm still Nashville born, but not bred. <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I'm a former Metro teacher. I started my career at Antioch High School um, teaching chemistry uh, and physical science was part of the team that created the Freshman Academy at, in, in Antioch due to overcrowding, and then was part of the, the founding um, team that formed Cane Ridge High School under the leadership of Dr. Laura Hall. During my time at Cane Ridge High School, I served as an ACT site coordinator, as well as a chemistry teacher and physical science teacher, and also a freshman, a freshman academy lead. Following Metro, I became a principal to a, a school principal to a private faith-based school, pre-K through eighth grade international academy in Nashville. Um, and during my tenure, I led the school through a reorganization and turnaround, um, achieving them their first time school accreditation. I have led and served on external review teams for school and in district accreditations across the state. In addition, I have assisted schools um, in school improvement efforts and continuous improvement practices to improve educational outcomes for all students. Currently, I own a education consulting firm specializing in school improvement for early learning and K-12 schools. I am also a commissioner on the Metro Action Commission and serve on several boards and advisories, including the Metro, Act uh, the, the, the Metro School STEAM Advisory Council and Pencil, to name a few. And most recently, I served on the Vice Mayor's Initiative for After School Programs. Um, but most importantly, my husband and I are parents and guardians to five children who graduated from four Metro high schools across the district, starting with McGavick High School in 2004, Antioch High School in 2010 and 11, Hillsborough High School in 2016, and MLK in 2018. And I'm still in the game. I have a rising second grader that's still in a district four elementary school. So I'm in it for the long haul. And so many people have asked me, um, why do I want to join the board? That's a common question. I think the simple answer for me is I love children. I have dedicated my entire, uh, more than half of, or, or most of my adult life um, in some capacity educating children. I have attended school and achieved and received um, my, ma my, my degree in chemistry, as well as a master's in educational leadership, uh, from Tennessee State University, and then my doctorate in educational leadership from Trevecca University. And so I consider myself a lifelong learner, um, and I, I, I just fundamentally believe in the responsibility that we have, a, that, that believe that we have a collective responsibility to ensure that all children, no matter who they are and where they live, receive access to a high quality education from a diverse population of highly qualified administrators, teachers, and support staff. So as a principal, as an external review leader, and now a consultant, I have guided teachers and school leaders and boards through comprehensive data-driven and research-based practices to effectively drive student performance um, and create sustainable uh, continuous improvement models for schools. And finally, as a parent, I have really seen firsthand the struggles and successes uh, parents face as they're navigating the school system with their families. Um, and so with, with my 20 years of 20 plus years of experience, along with really a holistic view from, from my experience both within the district and outside of the district as a community partner and as a parent, um, I, I look to bring that holistic view and well-rounded view to our board um, as we look at developing policies, um, strategically looking at how we streamline and set budgets, um, and guiding and monitoring our director of schools for to improve educational outcomes um, and advocate with all of our stakeholders across our community for our public school system. Thank you, uh, Chair Porterfield. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Dr. McKinney, uh, for that uh, wonderful information. Very quickly, uh, what's your number one priority if you are appointed? 
So, so that's that's a tough question right now. Um, be, we're right now are, uh, we are in a crisis due to COVID, and so I guess right now if we're talking about our number one priority. Our number one priority right now is is how are we going to to have an effective learning environment for our students um, due to remote learning, and how do we integrate students back into reentry within within the school building? So that would be my number one priority my second priority um, following that would be um, would be around equity we have had you know due to um, the, the several you know all the things that have been happening lately it has truly been highlighted the the lack of inequity that we have across our school districts and ensuring that our schools are equipped with the necessary resources that they need um, to provide that quality education. And when we talk about resources, we are talking about um, a, a, a diverse population of teachers within our schools. We are talking about wraparound resources for social emotional learning and supports. We are talking about um, support staff and ensuring that we have the adequate amount of support staff to be able to true, really and truly provide an equitable education and quality program for our students. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Cash, very, very, very quickly. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks to you both. Uh, are, are, are schools given enough autonomy to develop their own character and missions, or are they too, decisions too top down? Um, and what role could a school board member play in finding the right balance in those things? Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I. Again, my apologies to the candidates, to the council members that we have to do this like a game show that has to get in before commercial. Um, it's just a council thing that needs to be fixed. But thank you, Dr. Bob McKinney, um, Mr. Little, Ms. Bradford, Dr. Chauncey, um, and everybody for participating. Um, so uh, rules committee members, we just need to vote on whether or not each of these members meets the qualifications um, without objection. We can take them all up together. And um, I'll ask that uh, council members with their hands raised, take their hands down, and then that anybody who wishes to vote no on one or more candidates raise their hand. And I see no hands raised. I believe we still have seven members here. So the vote is seven in favor or none against all four members uh, who we'll see next door here momentarily. Um, so that will end the joint meeting. We rules committee members, please don't run away. We still have to very quickly um, Back in session, our rules committee for Dr. Smith, who is on the line. Dr. Smith is up for the appointment to the Board of Health for a term expiring May 30, 2025. Uh, Dr. Smith, can you hear me? Are you are you here? Yes, I can, and I can hear. Thank you. Great, thank you. Welcome. Would you mind introducing yourself uh, real quickly and talking about your interest on the board, in the board? Oh, very briefly. My name is uh, Dr. Calvin Miles Smith III. I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia, but have been here in Nashville since 2001. I'm a proud graduate of Meharry Medical College here in Nashville uh, and have remained here in Nashville throughout my matriculation and uh, trained at Metro General Hospital as well as the Murfreesboro VA Hospital in uh, Meharry's internal medicine program. I stayed on as the chief resident at Meharry Medical College's internal medicine program and then joined the faculty uh, with the joint appointment at Nashville General Hospital, as well as with Meharry Medical College. Uh, I've also worked in the city at uh, St. Thomas Midtown Hospital and uh, at a couple of other outlying hospitals here in the Metro Nashville area, uh, working as a hospitalist. But my primary interest is as a primary care physician. I actively work in a clinic uh, four days of the week here at uh, Nashville General Hospital, uh, as well as serving as an assistant professor uh, of internal medicine and associate clerkship director for our students at Meharry Medical College. And uh, most recently was appointed as the uh, admissions uh, chair, as well as the dean, assistant dean of admissions for Meharry Medical College. Uh, my interest in public health, uh, I just, during this COVID uh, uh, pandemic, 
I was appointed as the uh, clinical lead for our testing site at Meharry Medical College. Uh, I gladly stepped up and served in that role, uh, leading in the uh, testing of our citizens of Nashville as they would come through our, our campus. And then uh, as we expanded out to the sites uh, that uh, include the site on Nissan, uh, Nissan Stadium's uh, parking lot, as well as the site at uh, the Kmart on uh, Murfreesboro Road, I was appointed the clinical lead for the large site at Nissan, where we see uh, upwards to 900 patients a day. Uh, and so uh, I've been serving the city as one of the testers. I've been a spokesperson for Meharry Medical College on uh, some of the various media outlets here uh, and really have been kind of uh, very uh, forthcoming about uh, trying to serve the best interests of the uh, citizens of the city of Na uh, Nashville. And uh, uh, very glad to be a part of this council. Great. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I apologize for this, what I wish was a stupid question, but it's where we are in the world. Do you believe in science and listening to medical experts? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely do believe in science. Not only do I believe in science, uh, I, I teach evidence-based medicine to uh, medical students uh, as well as to my patients. Uh, I'm a very strong advocate of the, uh, the uh, advice of people who have been trained and who uh, daily practice this information. Uh, our leader at Meharry Medical College is a trained immunologist and virologist, and I believe very strongly and told his line very strongly because uh, I've seen it in action and, and know uh, that uh, in, in a lot of other places uh, it's been done very well. So I think we can do it in Nashville as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments for Dr. Smith? Oh, sounds like a great addition to the Board of Health. Um, would anybody who wishes to vote no or abstain, please raise your hand. All right, we are seven in favor, none against. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We'll see you next door in the chamber in just a second. Um, and uh, Rules Committee is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your patience and all your work. Thank you.